Hello and welcome to the Mr. Strategy and Mrs. Wellbeing Show. Sharing other, not what you might usually expect, examples from the not-profit sector. Hello awesome humans and welcome to episode two of Mr. Strategy and Mrs. Wellbeing. Um, First of all, a big thank you to anyone who did tune in to um, episode one. We got really brilliant feedback uh, and it really sort of chivied us on to think that we're heading in the right direction and this is something that the sector um, would really benefit from. Um, but if this is the first time that you've um, tuned in, basically what Claire and I are trying to do um, is focus on people and culture but in a in a different way um when when claire and i first got together to talk about this project we realized that even though we work in two very different fields um i work in strategy and claire works in well-being and management what we actually do is very similar because our focus is very much on um, people and humanity uh, and driving culture um, within charities so if there is a sort of strap line for this podcast, it's very much along the lines of not what you would conventionally think of as. Um, so from Claire's perspective, well-being isn't about yoga and quinoa. Um, and from my <laughs> perspective, strategy um, isn't about um, Venn diagrams and intersections and dusty dusty old paperwork um, and no pyramids for, for, for anything that I do. It all boils down to people and culture. People and culture are going to change the sector. Um, so unlike episode one, we actually have a guest this time, which is absolutely brilliant. So I'm just going to hand over to Claire to introduce our, um, our incredible guest. Hello, yes, and thank you so much today to the amazing, wonderful Kate Lee extraordinaire. <laughs> Um, uh, Kate, uh, Kate is currently the Chief Executive of the Alzheimer's Society. She joined as Chief Exec in March this year. Interesting time to join any job, let's be honest. <laughs> Prior to this role, she was the CEO at the Children's Cancer Society, uh, Children's Cancer Charity Click Sergeant for four years, during which time she rebranded the organisation, setting new values and building a culture of total team working. She successfully lobbied government to fund the funerals for all children under the age of 18 and founded the Children and Young People's Cancer Coalition. Kate is a proud Yorkshire woman Yay! and now lives in Coventry with her husband, her two teenage children. She loves gardening and tea cosies. <laughs> tea cosies. Tea cosies. <laughs> Kate is here today uh, to talk to us about not what you might conventionally expect from an approach to creating and influencing great organisation culture. Now, I reached out to Kate originally um, as a result of the fundraiser wellbeing survey that I undertook last year because of the sheer number of people who mentioned Kate by name as what an amazing asset to the sector, what a great leader, what a great manager, two totally different sets of skills, but what a great person to have leading you on or by your side motivating you on in an organisation and just what an amazing culture she creates wherever she goes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Tell us how you do it, please. <laughs> oh my God, it's about setting me up to fail there, Claire. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all the recipients, to everyone who filled out your survey for their very kind words. That was lovely. Um, uh, I'm sure there was loads of people mentioned, but uh, I think, so I wanted to just chat a little bit today about culture and just about maybe some of the things that I kind of hold value, you know, deeply and hold close to my heart that I think probably play out in the ways that I've tried to develop the culture of the organisations that I'm chief exec of. And uh, the first thing I should probably say is that it's a real privilege to be a chief exec of anywhere. It's a really, it is a tough job. You know, lots of people look up for the answers to stuff. Uh, certainly these last six, seven months have been a really, really tough time. And I know that lots of chief exec colleagues around the sector have really you know had it tough and you know we talk about it being lonely at the top of the pyramid way um, but we you know it really has been I think this last six or seven months I think we've you know earned our stripes but equally it has been tough throughout the whole of organizations and so I think for me thinking about just 
culture and culture change in organizations it's been quite interesting thinking about what people want and need from the organization right now so some of what i'm just going to mention has been slightly changed i suppose my approach my thinking has been changed over the last six seven months particularly kind of having a style which mine is very personable it's very rah 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 i talk about myself being chief cheerleader it's very pom-poms it's very um in person and so for me you know uh certainly working remotely and by zoom all the time has in part kind of a bit cut off my right arm over some of the styles and leadership things that I would feel like I had in my toolkit. It's quite interesting. So I also gonna fess up to the fact that I went on a course just yesterday um, oh, about how go. you manage. So you've got like kids been on a course, uh, how you manage really uh, complex change in very, very big organizations. So there was a presentation by D. Gary Hamill, who is one of my favorite um, kind of management and leadership gurus of all time. He's very anti-bureaucracy, but also by Helen Bevan, who's chief transformational officer in the NHS, who talked about you know, how do you transform culture in an organization with, with over one and a half million employees? So it's really interesting. So lots of stuff chimed through. I think I've been trying to kind of think about this podcast and, and uh, what is the essence of this? And I think for me, it's about trying to really understand why people come to work, right? So it's about, and, and again, there was a discussion on this thing that I listened to last night, which was about the tension between what the organization wants and what individuals want. And how do you marry that? And how do you marry that as a chief exec to make sure that you really are playing to what individuals want when they come to work, really making sure that they have that great experience. Most people come to work, actually, certainly in our sector, because they want to make a difference, you know, and they have a perception about what that is. We have very high levels of integrity in our sector, so people want to do things right. They really want to feel like they're creating impact for the beneficiaries we work with. And yet, actually, some of the organizational tension, particularly in big charities, is about, you know, how do you manage cost, efficiency, you know, uniformity, how do you make sure every service user across the UK is getting a similar quality of service? And that becomes an inevitable tension in the culture of the organization. So how do you make sure that every fundraising experience is great? How do you make sure every donor is great? We have experts that do audience insight with our donors that know that stuff. Uh, you know, if they are then telling the fundraisers on the ground, this is how it works. How, how do those fundraisers on the ground feel about saying actually I, I know what my donors want too you know so I think that becomes a real tension in the organization and I think some of that is what is challenging to manage so I think the first thing for me about great culture is constantly putting myself in the seat of maybe a dementia advisor working in Newcastle or somebody processing you know invoices for us sat in Plymouth you know what is it about the organization that's going to make them feel great? What makes them feel like they've given something back? What makes them feel like they grow and are growing in the organization that we are feeding what they need to be motivated? And there was a stat last night, which was quite worrying. Only 15% of employees, this was um, some research undertaken for Harvard Business Review, only 15% of employees across the globe are engaged in their work. Really One five, 15 really engaged in their work about 65 percent are disengaged or couldn't care and the difference are actively disengaged from their work and kind of proactively unhappy and and potentially kind of spreading uh discomfort and that's that's not in our sector that's across the world so the key for me is and the discussions last night was how do you engage that that kind of group of people so there's something about thinking about how you empower people and push decision making back down the organization which is exercising me at the moment we all want control over our own lives i think our loss of control over this period of lockdown the mass uncertainty over this period of lockdown has been really really hard and one of the things that i've done as a leader to counteract that is to be incredibly honest with people all the time even with the difficult messages and we'll often have a debate about saying, you know, this happens. I've heard this so many times. How do we tell the staff X or how do we tell the staff that this is going wrong? And I say, you just use those words. This is going wrong. <laughs> you know, don't, don't wrap that up. 
and that is about being honest with people because in that honesty you give them back the control people don't always want to hear it it is sometimes really frightening but people have control of their lives to make decisions based on facts that they know if you start to sugarcoat that or manage that in an alternative way or or try to kind of not have that absolutely honest transparent approach with staff teams People are canny and they know that there's something else going on. They know there's a, a hidden agenda. They're not daft. They know we're discussing these things. You know, they know that we're discussing about, you know, if we've got on one hand to take, you know, 28 million pound out of the organization, they know we're discussing jobs, They're not daft. So I think there's something about treating adults as adults. I think there's also something about being people's public cheerleader, which I know that you both follow me on Twitter, so you know that uh, it's something that's quite important to me, is actually calling out constantly best practice, amazing performance, dedication to cause. And this was something I was told a long time ago by someone I consider a real massive influence in my own leadership style that I worked with nearly 20 years ago which is for every difficult conversation I have, for everybody I pick up on something they're doing that isn't right, I need to make sure I thank at least two people that are. So if I have spent a day doing a very difficult, say, disciplinary or a challenging conversation with a team, making sure I then spend, you know, my commute home writing thank you cards to the amazing people in the organisation that are doing stuff well. So I think some of those things become a balance about um, and encouraging my managers to do the same thing. Um, and I think the final thing about culture, which again is something that matters to me, and I've said this before, but the culture of my organization and when you become chief exec, there's probably no point in your career that, that this is more important. The culture of my organization is set on the worst behaviors I allow. And I like to be liked. You know, I like to be cheerleader. I want them all to love me. And that's been a difficult thing to learn in my leadership that sometimes I have to just nip in the bud that behavior. And I've learned, I've had to consciously learn techniques working with my coach over the years on how to do that. You know, so I will say to people, you know, that thing you've just done, are you comfortable with every single member of your team doing that? Because if you're not, you need to stop doing it. Because, <laughs> you know, what you're role modeling here, what you're saying to people is this kind of, you know, take me on if you want to fight, it's fine. If that is the approach you want to use to your leadership, expect them to fight because that's what you're role modeling. So I think some of that has been a challenge, but it's also kind of embedded in me about thinking about how I work and how I operate. Um, in the terms of like what I want to lead and drive from culture from the top. So I don't know if that all makes sense, but they were my thoughts and my notes when you asked me this question about how do you do culture differently? Oh, mate, that was bloody brilliant. And <laughs> so I say also just really refreshing. Like it sparked a couple of questions with me. First of all, like I spend a lot of time with, with leaders, like helping or facilitating with organizational strategy and kind of how do we get from here to there here to there and all that sort of stuff and it's really rare that people like what you said really chimed with me about putting yourself in the shoes of someone in Newcastle doing invoices or someone in, mm. in Plymouth who's a, who's a frontline worker and I think and this is not a diss to a lot of charity leaders and CEOs but I think that's quite rare and I, I don't you know and what the question that I'd like to ask is that sort of people focused strategy, because it's not just about culture, this is about organizational strategy as well. Is that focus, is that something that's intrinsically always been inside you? Or is that something you've learned? Or is that something that you just know works? Um, I think it probably is more of a natural style for me. I'm quite a people person. And I think it is quite interesting because I do think as you both obviously worked out, there's a massive overlap between strategy and well-being, right? So, like, I know you've worked that out, guys. But um, if I just take that example, I think my ability to put myself, I mean, we've been down in this really difficult planning conversation recently about, you know, what are we honestly going to stop? And I think, you know, it is really important. It's very hard in charities to say these things are going on the back burner for 18 months. 
and no one wants to do that and it's bloody painful and particularly when they are really crucial things but we've agreed like the priorities at the moment keep getting your COVID-19 response out lobby government on better social care look after the money and look after the workforce they are the four priorities for the next 12 months it's just if we've got no other capacity just do those four things but it has meant that we've had to systematically talk about loads of things that we want to do you know kind of big culture change programs big um uh, you know, we want to do a lot more around uh, diversity and inclusion. We want to do a lot more about well-being. We want to do loads more about brand. Oh, your camera's gone off, Kate. Oh, uh, do you know what? Let me just re-plug that in. Charge that. That's fine. I don't know why that's gone. I'm going to come sorry. back and put your tea cosy on. Put your tea cosy on. Sorry, I'm back. And um, I think the thing for me is that I, uh, one of the things I was trying to get people to kind of envisage is, uh, so if you are, um, you know, I don't know, working in our safeguarding team, right, and you are just, you know, you're a kind of, you know, a member of staff who's got a relatively contract transactional job and you're in a safeguarding team. I said, just look back at this list of everything you want to do and think of all our corporate asks on them that are over and above their job. You know, we want them to start working to a new set of values we want them there's about five or six new policies we want to roll out across the organization we're asking them to work from home permanently so new ways of working we're changing where their work base is going to be um, you know we want them to think about how they can save money in their area they've maybe lost colleagues through redundancy so their role has changed like strategically if we allow all these things to remain in the let's get sorted out box and and in our strategy and our planning we are, are allow this mass of stuff you have to understand what all the implications of all those little bits all those little teams saying but i'm only doing this one thing i want to launch this new action in dementia action week i want this thing where i want every member of staff to do x and I'm only doing that, it's only my one thing. But you end up with all those people just doing one thing. And actually the pressure on that individual in the organization it just becomes unbearable. So what do you do? You either pick and choose which bits you wanna follow, which means we don't get consistency on anything. You try and do it all and you know it affects your well-being. You don't try and do it all and you have a bit of a sense of not being a good corporate player and a bit of a worry about oh how's that going to play out you know and that affects your well-being so actually we've got a responsibility right at the top to say you know all this stuff is amazing you know we want to think about our brand we want to do a lot more work in our audience insight we want to recheck we want to change the way we use evidence across the organization we we're doing a big piece of work thinking about our research portfolio that is all incredibly important, but the way it plays down the organization is to create a massive other work for yeah, people yeah. sat on the ground. So I think that link between that kind of, I think I've always probably been quite good strategically at being able to kind of forward think what we've just said we'll do, write down every tier of the organization for what that's going to mean for. And I do think when people talk about thinking time, that's the thing I think sometimes people don't have time to think through that uh, just affects then implementation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that absolutely rings true. That's great. And the, the other thing that was sort of playing on my mind when you were chatting there is that like, take for example, my workload, if you scroll back six months, like 75% 70, of my workload was writing three year strategies for charities. And that's, that was based on a very calm sea and you know there's a formula to it look back to look forward and all that sort of stuff and I, you know a lot of the stuff that i'm doing now is like really light agile strategy how do we get through the next six months been talking a lot to charities about if they move from one hierarchical structure to another hierarchical structure basically in six months time success is going to be how quickly you unpick the decisions you're making now because they're probably going to be wrong because it's almost impossible to predict what's going yeah, on yeah, yeah. so i just wanted to ask you as a as a big old mega brain strategic thinker how how your approach to strategy now has changed like how how are you projecting are you projecting forward three years are you just taking an agile what, what the hell is going on for you yeah so we i mean i there's a there's so much, I mean, it, so we, at the moment, we've written what we've called our bridging plan, which is to get us to March 2022. Our, the strategy we would have had that we've moved away from, which was New Deal on dementia, 
um, you know, loads of brilliant stuff in that. And we've not moved away from a lot of the kind of operational principles within that. But some of the challenges, you know, really significantly lifting our reach, you know, big expansion of dementia friends, some of those things. We've just got to be realistic that with the financial position we're in and the number of staff we've both had on furlough and some of the redundancies we've had to make just some of those targets and goals even if that kind of vision and aspiration hasn't changed some of those targets and goals have so we've moved away from that we've got this kind of bridging plan in place at the moment which really just hones down on saying that these four things are just all that matter right now mm -hmm. and we'll start over the course of the next 12 months to build up what we think strategically we want to do um, i think we will plan to be a smaller organization with a clear growth plan for when the money does come back online i mean our fundraisers to be fair have done the most phenomenal job um, and have mitigated a lot of what we thought was going to be a huge problem i mean we went into this thinking we were probably going to be 40 odd million short 40 to 45 million short we're probably going to be about 22 to 27 million short it's still a massive amount but to be fair those fundraisers have pulled it out of the bag um, but we're planning on having the same probably 22 to 27 million missing next year as well. So, so strategically at the moment, using this as an opportunity to consolidate the organization, you know, really kind of jettison some bits of the organization, which maybe for a while we've wondered, should they stay, should they go using that as an opportunity, thinking a lot about culture. That's going to be the big piece for us is working on culture between now and uh, March next year. And then year after, and then through the course of next year, I think we'll start to check. We want to check some of the underpinning assumptions in the organization actually about the way we were, you know, just give you one example. We want to go for full reach. We want to be the charity that is here for everybody diagnosed from the moment with dementia from the moment of diagnosis. We're probably thinking that we might want to go for an offer that is a kind of broad navigational offer really helping people plan avoiding crisis that kind of work so we're thinking about that but even within that where do you start so actually should we start with hard to reach um seldom heard communities do we start with some of those groups that really suffer with significant health inequality like people on the wrong side of the digital divide do we start with them and acknowledge that we'll move you know we might reach a hundred thousand people more or actually, do we go for mass reach straight off and reach 500,000 people more, but we might miss out on some of that health inequality piece. So the cause of this next 12 months for us is to take some time, not have an overstretching external agenda other than get the COVID response out, and then take some time internally to think some of these things through and engage people in these discussions and debates. So when this strategy is finished, I want ownership across the organization and a much more empowered culture. So a more empowered culture a really clear tight strategy and real ownership of that north star of where we're heading because yeah. that combination is what will deliver it mate gives a job <laughs> brilliant <laughs> <laughs> all right i just could talk about it i don't know i can do it Wait, yeah yeah, yeah. You're, talk you're, you're, it. you're talking a brilliant game i'm totally <laughs> forward to this. claire anything from you i guess i think my question would be, and it's, it's not a selfish question, but it's, it's about you. how do you make sure that you are then up and there and cheerleading and pom-poms? How, how do you do that? How do you, this is a big job and this in the organisation you're in is a really big job, uh, regardless of COVID. So keep dropping in those extra things that mean that just your ordinary CEO job, this is not it. <laughs> what, do you, what do you, how do you look after yourself to make sure that you are this Kate Lee who, who is the, the vulnerable and the honest and the, the cheerleading and the personable when actually some days I'm sure like the rest of us, you just want to go and hide under a duvet and eat chocolate and binge on Netflix and go, I just don't want to be Kate Lee today. <laughs> <laughs> That's more often than you think. I mean, it is, it's a really good question, Claire, because I think my mental health has suffered over the last six months, you know, and I'm going to be honest about that. I felt I have had more ups and downs and less ability to cope and be resilient than I have at any other point in my life. And I think I've been quite public about saying, you know, I, I, you know, have had challenges with my mental health. I've had periods of depression in the past 
and um, it, it's been challenging. You know, I think there's been periods that I've felt really low. There's been periods where I've wondered whether I can do it. You know, um, I think I know myself well and that helps. So I know what to do when that, when those triggers start to appear so I can pick that up quite quickly. I think I have quite a good ability to say to myself, there's nothing you can do about that. So you've just got to put that away. So I think, you know, I was quite honest on Twitter the beginning of last week, I had just the most horrific day, a whole range of personal things that happened all on one day, awful news about the illness of a friend and just a whole load of things happen at home. And I was really not for six. And then I tend to, I, you know, I, I tend to externalize that. That's one of my ways of dealing with it is to, to I do talk about that. I think I talk about it because it's like, call it out. You know, don't let this be an elephant in the room, call it out, let people know I've had a difficult situation. If I'm really grumpy or I'm, you know, challenging or not my usual self, it help. I think it helps that people know, you know, she's been having a tough time this week. And I think in externalizing it, sometimes that's my way of like debugging and getting it out. And then once I've said it, it can't hurt me because it's out there. <laughs> so I think some of that is useful. And then what I do know I can do, and I, and I don't, I think it's just a trait I have. I can think you know what, I need to be there for my friend. I need to, there's, there was other things that have happened I can do nothing about. They were bloody awful. They're an absolute pisser in my life that they've happened, but there is nothing I can do about that now. There's no, you know, and then just try to kind of rebuild myself from that. What I would say is rebuilding, and I think of myself as a really resilient person, rebuilding yourself right now is really hard <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. I rebuild myself by going and sitting with some service users, go and spend a day with that dementia advisor or that invoice processor, you know, remind myself about their worlds and how I can make their world better. You know, remind myself that I have got the power to do that. Mm -hmm. They're all the things that rebuild me. And while it is so hard to do that, I, I, see even the most resilient people i know people in my life way more resilient than me that are like saying this is a really tough call for it um and i think it's just about trying to be kind with each other yeah yeah no that's yeah. that's the answer to it all isn't it be a good human just yeah absolutely yeah i say it all the time to people look are you a good person and are you trying your best yeah. i can't really ask for anything more and I ask myself that a lot as well, you know, like, are you trying your best right now? And there's, there's days that the inner critic in me says, no, you're not, you could be trying harder, you could have done that better. Um, in the, I, I said this to someone who was talking about their inner critic uh, this week, in the words of RuPaul, you got to say, I hear you, bitch, but now leave the room. <laughs> I've got this, I've got this. Uh, you know, and it is just keep saying, oh, that's in a critic talking. Yeah. Um, it's so, it's so hard. But I think maybe when I was saying at the beginning that I feel like some of the ways that I am as a person have been really taken away from me over this last six, seven months, which have made it harder for me to kind of adapt to my style. Um, but or, or just deliver as I usually deliver. But but then, you know, chalk it up to growth, chalk it up to learning. You know, I would have been someone who just said I could never have worked remotely for seven months and motivated and changed the workforce. And yet it's happening, you know, so just, just chalk it up to that. Oh, mate. And, you know, thank you for your honesty and your humanity there. I'm sure there's going to be loads of people watching this who have never heard a chief exec speak like that so that's really really positive um so thank you right now we can move on to the the second part of the podcast which is we're really going to delve into the psyche of kate lee these are really <laughs> tricky hardcore paxman style questions so okay, okay. Three, three coming from me and three coming from 
Claire, so it'll be a pincer movement. So we'll we'll get under your skin one way or the other. Um, okay. Now, the thing about the thing about Claire and I is that we're really good at ranting, and we do a lot of it. But you know, part of this podcast is to kind of put the rants to one side and go, yeah, well, what can we actually do about it? Um, so we've been trying to think a lot more positively in our work. So first question for me is like, what is the most positive thing that you've seen in the sector recently? I'm loving significantly more collaboration. I just am loving that and uh, maybe I'm very lucky but I mean I I've had so I think so many I mean in my chief exec kind of little world you know so many people being so genuinely considerate to each other and do you know what I've seen that's been really positive and uh, some people might not agree with this, but I think when people have put out notes about, you know, we're making redundancies, you know, we're really sorry, but we're struggling. Real genuine sorrow and concern coming from other charity chief execs in support of real solidarity. Yeah. And I actually think the reality is even this time last year, some of that would have been tinged with, thank God it's them and not us. Yeah, yeah. you know and some of that would have been tinged with a oh i'm sorry for you <laughs> you know we're doing marvelous and i just <laughs> feel that has disappeared that has disappeared recently i think we have been genuinely united as a sector in properly looking out for each other properly realizing even losing one charity from this sector is a disaster we need to stand together and uh uh, it's just been that has been so positive right at the very beginning of this um pandemic right back in almost april first couple of weeks uh, i did express a concern that i felt everybody was looking for one big charity to go under first yeah. so that it wouldn't be you <laughs> it had like an anxiety about like oh my god please don't let us be the first one to go under I think that's disappeared completely. I just, I just think it's been amazing. Well, you know, I love this sector anyway. I absolutely love it. But I just, I felt the most genuine warmth and care from other colleagues in the sector and, and a real sense of camaraderie, which has been incredible. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I think, I think there's, lockdown has brought a unity to the sector that really wasn't there before. And there's a lot more compassion and humanity out there. And that's yeah. a really good shout out. Um, all right. So, Kate Lee, what gets you out of bed in the morning, apart from that amazing tea cosy? Oh, wow, the tea cosy. Um, what gets me out of bed in the morning? I think um, there's so much to be done. And, you know, I think genuinely outside the society, I have a sense that we've got some amazing bricks in the terms of our kind of staff and what we do and the quality of our work and what's needed and we haven't quite got a wall yet and i that is exciting the thought that we've got even in these times of cutting back i think we've got a real transformational change which will step up care and support to people living with dementia across the uk I can see real, real genuine opportunity for the organisation. And, you know, that's great. It gets me out of bed in the morning when I, you know, just opportunities to talk with staff, you know, and, and I am still as wedded to this sector as I was the kind of day I was 21 and got my first job in it. So um, I, th I think my motivation around my work hasn't changed. Um, I don't think I, I never have been quite as rights based as some of my chief exec colleagues saying, you know, it's the injustice people with dementia face, because of course it is. But actually, I think what gets me out of bed in the morning is knowing I can make a difference for those 2,000 you know, 2, people that work for Alzheimer's Society that feel that injustice in every fibre of their body and are going to make exponential change for those people with dementia. I can make that change for them. And that's what kind of gets me up. Brilliant. Excellent. All right. So let's park Kate Lee, super CEO over here. <laughs> Kate, Lee, Kate Lee, the human being. What, what is your guilty pleasure in life? Oh, God. I, I just... I, I eat a lot of junk food. I just... I'm not... Um, Specifics, please. 
<laughs> What's my guilty pleasure? I eat a lot of Marmite crisps. I have just lived on Marmite crisps this entire lockdown. It's really Claire, rubbish. Really I just, I should, Marmite crisps are my guilty pleasure. I just, <laughs> I just live on them. I don't probably live on them. Like, they're my lunch nearly every day, Marmite crisps. Honestly, I, don't, I think I've got, yeah, they're Marmite crisps. Yeah, can you double bag in one day? Oh, oh, at least, yeah. at least. So I have gone through one of those whole like bags of six. <laughs> just, <laughs> just sit here eating them. And then I think, well, if I'd have bought one of them single big bags, I'd have eaten the whole bag. So it's just the equivalent. It's Mainly, just yeah. making plastic waste. But I don't, maybe I should lobby walkers to make a big bag so I don't have so much plastic waste. I think there's some serious sponsorship opportunities coming your way now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Girl crush over. <laughs> Right, it's just the devil's. Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> no. Who are the awesome humans you would like to give a shout out to, and why? Well, I have. I mean, there's. Oh my god, there's so many, isn't there? I mean, I think there's two groups of people that I'm just feeling at the moment. Like my view of awesomeness changes pretty much every day. So, uh, but there's been two sets of different sets of people that have just been incredible. I mean, I do think some of our um, ambassadors for Alzheimer's Society that are living with dementia are, and I don't mean this in a kind of patronizing or tokenistic way, but are, have just been immense to me in the terms of their support, their honesty, their challenge of me, but also their massive support and so generous with their time. And, you know, I think, I think that's, been really incredible those people are amazing I, I I don't want this to sound patronizing because that's the the last thing I would want but these people you know have a dementia diagnosis all the fear I hear about every day about the problems with dementia my own mum's got dementia so I've lived through that journey with her and seen her decline and yet the, the, the our ambassadors are so fixed on still saying I can make this better for the people coming next. And I just f I find that kind of motivation in people fascinating. And I think similarly, the people, and I think maybe it's because the other group of people who have just blown me away is, we've, we've got this awful situation going on in uh, dementia at the moment where people can't visit relatives in care homes. You'd have seen this in the paper, but in the papers, but uh, care home visiting has been stopped. So for people like me, who've got elderly relatives or, or you know, mums, dads, grannies, granddads in care homes, you can't go and see them at the moment. And there's a couple of kind of uh, rights-based groups that have sprung up. These aren't charities. These are just groups of residents, uh, families who have just kind of just gone for it. There's um, two uh, people, Julia Jones, Nikki Gerrard, who set up an organization called John's Campaign you know, not even a registered charity, but I just, I mean, these people will put their lives on hold to campaign for difference, you know, just, I mean, I wish I could be them. And I, and I sometimes think, oh, that's really interesting. I've taken this different route of being a charity chief exec, which in some ways is safer and more closeted. In some ways it's more exposed, but actually that absolute founder passion to say, nothing will stop me from trying you know I will take out a judicial review against the government as an individual to make this change that power in an individual that commitment to cause it is just blows me away in the amount people will commit of themselves personally professionally give their whole lives up to change things for hundreds of thousands of people I mean I just I find it I find it totally mind blowing and awesome and and makes me feel unworthy. So give us sorry, give us those names again, sorry, Kate. It was Nikki Nikki. So people like uh Julia Jones um and Nikki Gerard who um started John's campaign. Um, Diane and Jenny who launched Rights for Residents, who I had the most brilliant feisty debate with um last week. Just amazing two women who, who've got a one lost her father to COVID in a care home, which couldn't be with him uh, earlier in the year. Uh, the other's mom is, is in residential care, she can't go and visit her. 
you know, and I just, you know, these are people that just, you know, six, seven months ago were just ordinary people with ordinary jobs doing their thing, you know, and I don't know, going to yoga, doing whatever they do. And now they've allowed their whole lives to be dominated by, by making a change. So just, they blow me away. I just, they, they definitely drive me on. Brilliant. Thank you. Right then. Really, really deep question. Crumpets or muffins? Crumpets. I have no, crumpets. Ah, come on. Crumpets. Crump <laughs> muffins? What are muffins? They're just like <laughs> bread that's a bit hard. <laughs> no. Okay. And one for your staff. If you had to sing one song at oh. karaoke in front of your entire organisation, oh. which song would it be and why? Oh my. Uh, right. You have to Something pick one. I did not work out in the due diligence of going to Alzheimer's Society is the place is obsessed with singing. <laughs> Music is incredibly powerful for people with dementia. Incredibly. Right. We have Singing for the Brain. We have one of the UK's largest coordinated kind of dementia choirs. And I, I, I cannot sing a note. And I go to these virtual Singing for the Brain things and thank God my microphone's not switched on. And I just do like, <laughs> like but if i had to sing a song right if i had to sing a song and i have once or twice in my entire life uh luckily never in this country never in this country so i know it's not recorded never going to appear on youtube uh sung karaoke was so drunk i could probably just had to cling onto a stall uh i would sing miley cyrus the climb no way yeah. what way way <laughs> It's not about the view, it's about the climb. Don't you think that's just so powerful? <laughs> Monday is just so powerful with those words. I love it. You, you could have given me a hundred guesses, I'd never have guessed that. No. <laughs> My bit of, it's all about the climb. <laughs> oh, Kately, Kately. Uh, I just <laughs> I just want to say like thank you so much for coming on. Like from Claire and I's perspective, if there's one person in the sector that epitomizes that crossover between well-being and strategy it's you so oh thank you thank you no, thank you thank you no but matt and, and i'm sure everyone listening to this will be hopeful and feel better to know that there's a ceo out there like you working in the same sector as them so on behalf of everyone listening thanks as well uh and to, everyone, and to everyone um listening at home um keep Keep being human, keep in connecting with each other, and thank you so much for listening. Double thanks. Come on, Kate, you can do double. Oh.